Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support our show, go to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Sacred Symbols Plus, a PlayStation podcast supplement. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined today by a very special guest. He's so handsome. Rad all the way from California. How are you today, my friend? I'm doing good. Thank you for the nice compliment, Colin. Very friendly. Uh, but yeah, I'm doing good. Nice and sunny out today. Perfect California day. Cool, man. Yeah, I um, I do miss the more mild falls of California. And uh, it's getting hot here again for some reason. It's like back in the 80s. So I don't know what's going mm, on. Yeah. We just missed the... Uh, I'll talk about it a little bit more on Sacred itself. But we that hurricane that fucked everything up was like... It's fairly close to us. Um, yeah. And it really fucked things up pretty badly so i'm feeling for a lot of people down there um in Damn. north carolina and uh, tennessee and all that i don't know if you've seen any of that stuff but it's yeah it's my my brother lives right outside nashville mm. and he said they've just had some rain so it's been fine for them thank god but yeah it's scary man so we're wishing everyone the best over there but i'll get more yeah. of that on on sacred itself but brad today i wanted to get together with you just for a brief show about well maybe it won't be brief i don't know about uh dead rising deluxe remaster Mm -hmm. which just came out on september 19th we're recording this in very early october so um it is somewhat fresh um it is a remake kind of ground up remake in some sense (coughs) of the original dead master which or dead master dead rising which came out (laughs) in the summer of 2006 and uh i remember it very well um so yeah i played through this game i've the psn says i played it for 75 hours i don't believe that dude it's messed up it's too high on mine as well I think it it counts like pause time and everything like that. Some games don't. Some games do. But I would say I've probably played it for 40 to 50 hours. Um, I've beaten it six times, it says, because I'm on (laughs) like you start the the game does a cool thing where you can like use an old playthrough to start a new playthrough and just kind of travel, you know, track them through. And it says playthrough seven now Mm -hmm. um, for me. But that includes, I think, infinity mode and all the other things. Uh, I'm just going around cleaning up trophies now. So I should have the platinum in the coming days. I got all the hardest ones out of the way. Now I have to get like the most obnoxious ones out of the way Um, because I got the gold trophy, all the gold trophies, like the one for seven days in infinity mode, Mm -hmm. um, saving 50 people and so on and so forth. I got all that stuff, unlocked the Mega Man's Buster and the laser sword and all that, which makes the game trivial. Uh, But now I have to do like the rescue eight women at a time thing. And I Mm -hmm. I started doing it last night. You have to do a very specific shit. You have to go around and like kill people um, because it only spawns eight people at a time. So you have to kind of like manipulate the game into doing that. So I've really been enjoying my time with it. I'm curious what you think of, um, you know, high 30,000 foot view of Dead Rising, the luxury master. Yeah, um, I think it's a really, really special game. I um, it's definitely are old and archaic in a lot of ways, particularly boss fights, I think are pretty damn bad <laughs> in this game. They're pretty horrible. Frank moves like a tank, which is fine. That's how he moved in the old game. It's cool. But um. I definitely remember this game has a special place to mark because like, you know, 2006, this truly felt like one of the next gen games, something we're seeing that we hadn't seen before. All these zombies on screen, this really cool setting. So it definitely struck a chord with me and many other people at the time. But I think this is a really solid remake slash remaster of the game. There's some strange changes in the game, just some minor things that I don't know why they change, but it's not like a huge deal to me. But I still think it's a really fun game and a special game. And it makes me lament the series, the kind of direction it went, especially after two, like it went to three and four and no one really likes this game. So I think Dead Rising could be a game that could come back. But um, I do think Dead Rising in general is just an, an awesome little weird game with some very noticeable flaws. But I still enjoyed the hell out of my time playing with it. Yeah, there's something very captivating about this game to me too um the old one yeah i agree so i lived i was in college i was going into my senior year when um this game came out and my roommate got it um he was the one that had xbox 360 doug and um it's the same thing i I was saying this on another show and i'm so glad you agree i remember looking at this game i couldn't afford any of these consoles i mean ps3 was about to come out i already knew i was actually talking about it on a recent episode of with uh, that i guessed it on with on another podcast where i was like they were talking about getting your PS3 and were you excited? And I'm like, dude, when I saw the price of that thing, and the situation I was in in my life, I was like, there's just I wrote it off immediately. Like, there's no way I can afford this. Um, yeah. 
And I really had my mind on the Wii, which I also couldn't even find. And um, so 360, I, I gave I gave a fuck about Xbox at this point. So I, I had no interest in 360 at all. But my roommate had it and a lot of people around me had it. But Dead Rising stuck out to me as first of all, I was interested in it because it's a KG in a Fune game. And it's right. actually the last in a Fune game that he did with Capcom, Dead Rising 2 as well. But, um, you know, he's kind of like the creative mind behind this series, which I don't think a lot of people know. Um, and for people that don't know who Anafune is, he's obviously the creator of Mega Man and hence the heavy Mega Man references in the right. game. I love when you look at your watch and instead of saying Omega, it says Mega Man on it. It's like really cool, <laughs> cool stuff like that. But so I knew he was involved in it, but I, I, it's exactly what you said. I remember looking at it and being like, wow, this is amazing. Like I, I, I had never seen anything like it. And I don't know if you can, you can, um, understand this reference. I've been referencing this a little bit in regards to this game is that. It reminded me of the way I felt when I first saw the game. You were you were younger, but you were still might have played mm -hmm. it. State of Emergency. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Which was a, a rock star published game by a studio called Viz. I was actually looking at gameplay of it yesterday when I was preparing my notes. And I had no idea. I don't know. Again, this is one of those things where I'm like, what? How did I not know this? That <laughs> State of Emergency got a sequel, which I had no I idea. Know like many years what? later. Um, I don't remember that at all. But people might remember State of Emergency was this rock star published game where it was about like riots, basically. It was like a riot game. And the big thing about it was that there was tons of people on screen. And some of it took place in like malls and shit like that. So it had a uh, a very lo-fi Dead Rising feel to it. The, the unfortunate thing about, about State of Emergency, which is just kind of sucked. But the yeah. reason that people bought it was because if you bought the original GTA 3 on PS2, it was heavily advertised in the box, like on the back of the instruction manual. So everyone's like, oh, state of emergency. I remember when I bought it, I thought that it was the same people that made it. You know, I think I thought that for several years. So I was like, oh, it's like, mm -hmm. why does this game suck so bad when, you know, Grand Theft Auto is so good. <laughs> so I, I think of state of. So when I first saw Dead Rising in 2006, that's the game I, I thought of was state of emergency, which was like a two, an early 2002 game on PS2. And it's very of the time and place that the game is perfectly situated in its setting and its gameplay stylings and all that in the mid aughts, the mall, mm -hmm. the music, the colors, the humor. And I don't know the original well enough to know what they changed, but it seemed pretty true to the, what I remember about the original yeah. one. I know I think uh, Michael was telling me, I think they got rid of like the upskirt shot thing or something, they did. And, they which changed. I didn't even know was a thing and all that. So it's cool. That's I don't give a shit about that, yeah. but it seems like they tangibly didn't change anything. Do you know what they might have? They changed like some of the races of some of the characters I know, like uh, the butcher guy used to be like a Chinese guy, I believe, and they oh. just kind of made him a white guy. Just some <laughs> things like that. Nothing to like ruin the gameplay, in my opinion, just kind of like weird changes. I'm like, oh, well, you didn't have to do that, but it's not going to ruin the game for me by any means. KG and Afune leaning into his racism. Yeah, that's right. Um, but uh, so, yeah, it, it was it was a game. I, so when Dead Rising 2 came out, which I think was 2009, I want to say, or 2010 oh. at the latest. Um, I played it a little bit, but then I was like, yeah, I don't really have, I don't really want to play this. And I just never even messed with it. And then Dead Rising was done to me. In fact, an interesting PlayStation piece of knowledge is that Dead Rising 3 is not on any PlayStation console. Oh. 1, 2, and 4 are all available on PlayStation, but 3 is not available on PlayStation um, because Capcom, you know, was making these games for Xbox and was making them for Xbox originally. This game, um, mm -hmm. the original Dead Rising was an Xbox 360 um, exclusive. I want to say it was and it came to PC, I think, a little bit later, but then we didn't get it on PS4 until they re the, until they remastered the original in 2016. So it's kind of a mystery to some PlayStation fans. And uh, my, my high level thought about this game is that I, I recommend it. I think the price is right. I think the it takes a little bit of time, like you said, to get used to it. It is a little it's not janky. It's actually way better than the original one. You can move while you shoot and mm -hmm. do all sorts of things. But it it I remember playing it in the beginning and feeling somewhat overwhelmed by it and being like, I don't know if I'm gonna really stick with this. And then I just kind of got it. Yeah. And then I played it and we've been playing it constantly, basically. There's something very and, and getting to know it. I feel like I'm really intimately knowledgeable of the game. Like I, I know the layout, I know the enemies, I know what to do. There's something cool about wrapping your mind around all of it as you learn about it. And how the game lets you continue to play it even if you fail. Which yeah. I I also think is a unique so somewhat unique thing um yeah i mean i think that's what's great about dead rising one in particular is the setting not only i like it because i think the setting is cool the mall but it's the size i think is very appropriate 
in the sense that it feels big enough, but it's small enough where you can start to memorize the map itself very easily and not have to worry about your map. And I really appreciate like appreciated that. You know, I'd start to like recognize landmarks and be like, oh yeah, okay, I really know where this kind of mall is. It felt like it just immersed me a lot more into the game, I would say, instead of having to look at my map all the time, just learning the loadout of the mall itself. And then honestly, it's just a really cool mall. <laughs> like I would want to I would check out that mall if I could in real life. That food court man. I'd be mm. all over that. Looks yeah. awesome. It is cool how you just get to know it. It's basically a, a horseshoe with like a huge area in between. And then, you know, the tunnels underneath the parking garage and all of that. But yeah, if, like, if you're like in the northeast of the map, it's just like the movie theater and then like the part of the mall you start in. Then you get to like, you know, the next part of like underneath is the entrance area that you begin in. And then you go over to the left to like the outdoor mall area. And then you're starting to go up and you're back in the food court and then back on the inside of the mall. And then above that north of that is like the supermarket. And all mm-hmm. the under construction shit. So you just kind of get to, you get to know it. And yeah, you're consulting the map a lot, and then you're just suddenly not really consulting it very mm-hmm. much, which is is cool. The, the one thing I, I read some stuff about the game where people were like, "Oh, it would have been cool if it was like truly open, as opposed to like a tales like game where it's segmented." And I'm like, I don't yeah. think the game would really work like that. Like, I think that they could have made it run like that. I don't. I think it would have been trivial to make the whole game, um, yeah, of course, run like that. But I think it's actually manipulating it making things respawn, getting away from enemies. Like when enemies are around the mall doors, when you're in, going in and out, you just like jump into them and quickly hit triangle, mm-hmm. you know, to get inside so they don't hit you or whatever. So I like that they really stuck with their guns and didn't actually modernize it too, too much, apart from just some of the combat and the controls, which are just much cleaner. Yeah. And a really, really important thing that they added, which was auto saving. Because um, the original Dead, Dead Rising was extremely difficult. That's... Oh. Um, just yeah. because you had to you had to manually save and like the the survival mode required you to play the game for 14 consecutive hours without shutting it off which was made it one of the most notorious achievements and when they kept the list basically the same they did rename some of the, the trophies but people saw that and like oh god and then they you you realize like not only could it does it auto save but you can like fast forward and all that kind of stuff time at that time so they did do a little tweaking to make the game a little more manageable and accessible, a little more modern, but they kept it kind mm-hmm. of, st- this is what I'm interested in about Metal Gear Delta is how much they modernize it and how much they keep. It. It's actually from the same era. It's just a year earlier, you know, so um, Dead Rising is just a year older. So um, yeah, so shout out to the original Xbox 360 version. And, and this is an exciting and interesting Capcom kind of doing something. The other thing about this that I think is worth noting, Brad, is it's like zombies weren't really worn out yet at this point. Resident Evil, Capcom have been doing Resident Evil at this point for 10 years. And there's some like random movies and all of the rest, but this is pre Walking Dead and pre Last mm-hmm. of Us and just a lot of things that I think really wore out zombies. Very similar to what I've, I've been really making fun of so called fantasy slop recently, where I'm like, things just felt quainter and different before they were run into the ground. And I think this game would have really not shown as much if it didn't come out when it did, but rather right. now. It was, in other words, like kind of a harbinger of things to come yeah totally and i think this game had enough going on that set it apart from like resident evil particularly just the horde of zombies like we were saying that's what really made it stand out to me when i first saw it it's just like what is this game like i've never seen this many enemies on a screen before except maybe outside of a muso but they would like fade away as you ran closer to them or farther away from them so it was really surprising to me and uh yeah not a lot of enemy diversity obviously and it's it's not like the craziest deepest game on that strip by that in, by any imagination but it feels it's just fun it's quirky yeah. it's weird so let's get into some of the stuff I, re- I wrote a bunch of notes last night here on my i just typed them up um let's talk about um well <laughs> yeah we'll start here this makes the most sense uh, combat mm-hmm. um combat feels simplistic when you get used to it in my opinion mm-hmm. i don't like the seeming level of rng in some sense of why you do or don't get attacked or grabbed by zombies it doesn't really make any sense and i find it quite frustrating because i've been i was fan i'm not gonna do it but if i had time to to make videos and like really do shit it would be funny to do a passive playthrough of the game like how Mm -hmm. how could you do it non-violently for the most part um and it would I think work better if you weren't just randomly grabbed so much. Now, I understand that that's a, me- a major mechanic of the zombies grabbing you and then you have to kind of like use your skills, you know, what if you have any of them unlocked and 
you lose a bit of health. I get all of that, but it just seems like there's no rhyme or reason to why I'm being grabbed sometimes and why I'm not being grabbed sometimes and why I'm being attacked and thrown to the floor and all these kinds of things. So that's a little frustrating, but the game does feel really dangerous from a gameplay perspective, especially when you start and you don't have anything. Right. I have to remind myself as I've been playing it the last little while with the Mega Buster and the laser sword and all the shit you unlock and the magazine that gives you unlimited durability. And it's like the game becomes so trivially easy that you're like, why am I even playing this at this point? But when you do get into it, it is quite scary. And yeah. and uh, I like the the tenuousness of it, finding the iron rod or using your fists and grabbing a gun off of a dead cop and doing all this kind of stuff. I thought it was pretty cool. So what did you think about the the core gameplay, the combat? Um, yeah, I agree. I think early on, it is very dangerous. You definitely feel that desperation where you're literally using anything you can as a weapon. Like uh, <laughs> you're hitting guys with serve bot helmets or whatever, just like a mannequin, anything you could find. It's it's really great. And I think that's I honestly think early Dead Rising is the most fun because it is such a struggle. Like later on, you know, um, which is cool, too. But you're just like, jump kicking zombies heads off really easy like that you're picking them up and throwing them which is goofy and fun but i think the the appeal to me of dead rising is using anything you can as a weapon and really struggling during all that stuff but i do think it's important and i think it's uh really good the sense of progression you get throughout the game like frank really does start to feel way more powerful like um the hunters you remember like there's the the dad and the two sons or whatever Mm -hmm. that shoot at you i'm I ran into them just my first time and um, I just couldn't catch them. I was like, I'm too slow. I can't catch these guys. I need to get up my speed. So I thought that's a really interesting mechanic in the sense that sometimes you just got to grind. I feel like like you could probably do it, but it, it could definitely help out. And I appreciate that, like putting in the effort to level up Frank and all that stuff really goes a long way. Um, I think the combat feels good when you hit so- a zombie with something, which is really important. Like when you cut a zombie in half with a katana or something like that, it like feels visceral and good and like you see all the blood spray and everything like that that's really important to me the sense of impact so i think all that stuff's great but um yeah and i just like even just like punching a dude with um like frank just you know mashing square or something like that i think feels good so i think all that stuff they really nail and this the sense of impact like i said is extremely important and it still works very well so i think it is simplistic especially early on but I would say maybe it's even a little more complicated than it needs to as you go further on, just like the amount of moves that you can learn with Frank. And it's it's cool that it's not necessary, but I appreciate them putting that effort in there. So I think it's solid, the foundation. And obviously they built up from it, but I still think today it still handles very well, except some of his movement, which we'll probably get into later, I think is a little sloppy. Yeah, there's a, there's a few things to complain about from that perspective, too. It's funny because you brought up the progression, which is definitely something I want to talk about as well. The game does do a nice job of making you feel stronger and stronger, which is cool. I was wondering, I don't really have much of a preference in this case, in this regard, especially in this game, but I wonder if the game would have been stronger if you could have spent your skill points as opposed to them being automatically put into a, a sequence like predictable and repeatable sequence of of upgrades. And that's fine, too. That's very old school, like Dragon Quest, very old school Final Fantasy. It's like you learn fire at level 18. You learn, you know, I think that's cool, but I, it would have been more interesting to maybe give you a little bit more customization on how you wanted Frank to kind of evolve over time, because, yeah, you're kind of waiting for him to get faster. You're waiting for him to unlock more um, inventory slots and do more of those kinds of things. And it would be cool to be able to customize that a little bit more to get to where you're going a little quicker, a little easier, sacrificing, of course, some mm-hmm. other part of it. But I do dig like there is a role playing game like progression that if you put it in 2006 is kind of ahead of its time in, ter- in, in these kinds of games. They, it wasn't this is pretty deep. Mm-hmm. And again, another thing why I think is uh, was so appealing, why it was so appealing to uh, to Dead Rising fans. So or to video game fans, Dead Rising was. So what were some of the weapons that you like to, to fall back on? I think as I got my cadence going, the katana ended up being my favorite weapon and you can just kind of source them infinitely at the sword shop in the yeah. entrance plaza so i would always make time to go there and i would like to i i picking up the submachine guns were cool too if you could find them or sniper rifles um and then when you, when the human enemies start coming their assault rifles and rocket launchers are cool as well but i was really all about the katana loved the katana mm-hmm. what what kind of weapons did you um go towards well, like you, I did go to the sword shop, but I used the like the just the broadsword kind of more. And so the katana, I felt like it could combo longer. 
like at the katana, I remember it could do like a couple slashes, I think, then he would pause for a second. But with the um, the broadsword, like the two handed sword, I feel like the arc was just a little cleaner, a little more reliable for me. So, dude, that section where there's the sword store in the market, like right next to each other. I was there all the time hitting both those things up, getting like juice and milk loaded up, then like five swords. You can just clean house for like anything. Yeah, because I didn't I didn't even find the gun store till really late, actually, in the game. I like missed it completely. I was like, I, th- I was like, I could have sworn there was a gun store in this game, but it's just like I missed it. Yeah, there's like a you can rescue people from there if yeah. uh, but I don't think you get like the hint. I think you have to just go at a certain time and you find like three people hold up there and they start shooting at you and they think you're a zombie and then they apologize and they come with you or whatever. And yeah, you can grab a shotgun, a sniper rifle, a pistol and a submachine gun, I guess, from there. The assault rifle and the rocket launcher are only from the the actual soldiers that you meet right. later in the game. Um, yeah, I, I mess with the sword. I guess uh, in thinking back on it, the, the broadsword probably is a better weapon because it seemed like they slashed it at the same speed, but it had like, yeah, like you said, a greater arc as well mm-hmm. around you. But yeah, I loved the katana. And uh, did you use any of the magazines or books? I did specifically use them in the infinity mode because you really do need to use a few of them. They're really important, sure. uh, especially the health ones. Like you can stack them. So there are three magazines that give you more food health. And I think you can increase it up to 200 percent. And then it makes infinity mode much um, easier, although still somewhat difficult. Um, yeah. So what do you have to say about all that? Well, for the magazines, I think I just used a like a plus one durability one. I think I found for just a little bit. But then eventually I just kind of I was so into just using new weapons and just goofing around with all that kind of stuff. I just eventually left them behind because I I only played through the game once. So I didn't do like new game plus where that probably really shines a lot more. I was just so into having the vanilla Dead Rising experience of just picking up random shit wherever I could find it most of the time. and. um yeah, just struggling. Like I wasn't trying to like min max necessarily, except for I did use the sword when I knew there was like an annoying boss fight coming up or something like that. I would go back and stock up. But other than that, I just I was just into picking up whatever I could find around me. Yeah, I liked using the iron pipes that you'd find. Those were pretty cool. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think of what else. Oh, the um notoriously the mannequin torso is a really powerful weapon if you find the yeah. that or whatever um on different mannequins in the mall shelves it's funny that you know that elevator when you go up and down to the to the roof to get to your safe house or whatever and you every time you open the elevator there's like a ton of zombies in there it'd just be so funny because i would start yeah first like i would just start i would open it and then just start slashing and just destroying all of them but then i would take like a shelf and just throw it when the door opened and it would, <laughs> yeah there's a lot of really fun stuff you can do in the game and uh yeah and in different ways to play it which i think is a lot of fun the the, the gunfire doesn't work so well against the armored human enemies um or the psychos it seems like but no but yeah anyway um so one thing i i did like about the combat and kind of just playing the game was it f- i don't want to say the game felt grounded it's not really a grounded game by any stretch of the imagination but i liked that the zombies weren't there it, it's not like the last the last of us is awesome obviously but it's not like the last of us where it's like well some of these guys can see and some of them can and they're and some of them are really aggressive and then some of them are really big. And, and there's like it's very video gamey. It's like, oh, yeah, OK, like we're progressing and things are getting more difficult. I did like how the game was like, no, the zombies are all really stupid They're None of them are really going to attack you unless you come near them. If you stand in the middle of them, they'll slowly lumber towards you. But I did dig that. It just seemed like you were they were almost passive and were just there. And I thought that that was kind of interesting as opposed to trying to make it more adversarial because just the very nature of surviving in the game as opposed to having also to deal with really clever zombies that chase you around and shit like that just i didn't want to deal with that Mm -hmm. i thought that was pretty cool what what did you think about the the psychopaths like as you said earlier the kind of the bosses (laughs) i I liked a few of them i I thought some of the clown one which is one of the first ones you encounter at the at the uh, ride in the in the mall is pretty cool i like the way when you kill him he dies like on his own yeah <laughs> yeah he's like laughing when he's yeah. like chopped up yeah and like you said the hunter family was pretty cool like one of them's mm-hmm. a coward and like won't and like misses you and like won't hit you um mm-hmm. which i think is pretty cool too there's there's a lot of interesting stuff in there the dude in the supermarket with the uh the like aggro shopping cart oh like yeah from you was pretty cool yeah that guy's funny and i like fighting the one too in the in the woman's clothing store where you can actually he sets himself on fire with a molotov and you can actually save him and bring him yeah. as a survivor back and you have to actually do that to get the gold trophy for that um 
so yeah, what did you think about the psychopath fights? Did they add anything for you? Um, I think they're cool, and I really appreciate them being there because you know I just like to see all these wacky like. This game definitely has a sense of humor. It is very violent, but there is a comedic tone to a lot of it. And I always looked forward to seeing what I would run into because I it had been so long. I forgot many of them. Like, I remember the clown, of course, because he's so early in the game. But I forgot about the guy like the the war veteran who has like the machete. And he like goes down the um, it's like almost like a manhole. But like in that store, like the hardware store and stuff like that, he's having flashbacks. Um, I forgot about the Molotov guy. I actually killed him on accident. So. That was fun. I actually killed a lot of people on accident. Yeah, well, you have to like, there's like a fire extinguisher yeah. nearby and it doesn't really tell you that you could use it. And then you can yeah. just use it on it, which is funny. And then everyone's cool with it and they just want and they bring him back to the room as if nothing happened, which is so strange. Yeah. And I liked um, the movie theater, like the cult or whatever mm. going on in there. Those psychopaths, they're doing their whole ritual things in there. I thought that was really cool. Man, I loved the movie theater. And I want to go to that movie theater in real life. It's so cool. It's like space themed. Man, that was awesome. But um, I didn't I probably missed many of the psychopaths. I think there was one in the hunting store I missed, like you said early on, because I didn't find it till way later The oh, man, the convicts in the Humvee. Oh, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Did you kill them? Did you kill them? Did you, no, uh... no, because I, I didn't know how to kill them again. I was like, well, I don't have a gun and these guys are just mowing me down. So I just ignored them for the whole playthrough. But it it did add a fun level of tension every time I'd go out there with a survivor. I'm just like, oh, God, please don't see me. And I just see their names in the background. Just yeah, yeah around. Like the, the health bars. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It's funny. I, I did struggle with that a little bit when I first encountered them. So I had a submachine gun and I kept dying and I wanted to say there's a woman out there. They like kill her husband and you can actually like, bring yeah. her back. Um, and she's you actually have to go and kill her manually in the uh, in the bring eight women thing uh, that mm -hmm. I was talking about the trophy, which is funny. So it was a little <laughs> dark, but um, I wanted to save her. So, yeah, I, I, I spent like an hour just trying the game re because of the really nice quick save system you're just kind of put right back towards the beginning of that fight if you have it and then right. i eventually figured it out but what's so funny about that is again the triviality of having the mega buster later and just each of them die in one hit when you oh man that's crazy, them, which is just yeah. so funny so it becomes such a f but i do like that scene where you like you can hear the music out of the out of the jeep or whatever and then when you kill them like everything's silent so there's some, some cool yeah. some cool touches. yeah, yeah. yeah really and cool. by um, and by the way i feel like there's a mega man dynamic in this game like i i feel like you're not literally selecting who you're going to and like what stages you're going to, but just the inherent nonlinearity and having these bosses in different places and doing different things. And it, it's very in a fune. And I'm not sure I really appreciated that until I played through it this time about. In fact, I was always like, oh, Dead Rising so strange. Like, wh where did he come up with this idea? Right. Considering all he's done. And it's like, oh, it's actually kind of Mega Man coded in some sense. And mm -hmm. not and I'm not saying just using the Mega Man outfits and all that kind of stuff. There's there's a lot to it from that perspective um and i like the outdoor area i i one of the things i really liked about the game was how it tracked and we should talk about this like the day night cycle obviously and like the real time nature of it but you know majora's mask style but i did like how the game was reflective of the time of day no matter where you were inside or outside so you could be outside in the middle of the night it's dark obviously and 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 scary but inside the light like you could tell that there's like a lighting system on some sort of timer and so that it, it it's not always bright like it's very dangerous it, it feels like a castlevania 2 style day night mm -hmm. cycle where things yeah. get more more and more dangerous as you go which is cool um you were bringing up food earlier did you mess around i didn't mess around with this yet i have to do it for a trophy actually but mixing the foods in the blender just a just a tiny little bit i think it's cool little element to it but i didn't do it a whole lot like i did it maybe once or twice did you cook your kind of food going? no i actually totally forgot about that when i was playing the game I, I didn't actually know about that because you do find raw meat. And I'm like, what do you it, it seemed weird, mm -hmm. but I would eat it. Yeah. And then, <laughs> yeah. And then I read like, oh, those ovens. I thought that was kind of cool. Like, oh, there's like these ovens and you just put it in there and wait a second. And then it pops out a, a well done steak and you can eat it. And how the meat gets bad if you don't cook it, which I yeah. also didn't realize because then I ate it and then you get like stomach aches and it doesn't really do anything to your health. It just makes you keel over kind of. Yeah. Similar, very similar to overtime mode where you just start keeling over more and more if you don't solve your zombie disease in the 24 right. hours that you're given um let's see what else here um yeah magazines and books we talked about this a little bit earlier but yeah i just kind of i didn't want to use the slots in my inventory for them really but i but i did realize like wow these are like the 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 one you get you get things for like the like i said the mega buster the laser sword and the booklet and all that 
for in, in, um, infinite durability by doing certain things in the game. And it obviously breaks the game deeply. But I was always more into just I had like a bunch of wine bottles with me and, you know, juice or milk or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then a couple of katanas and maybe a firearm. And I just didn't want to use the inventory space on a magazine right. or a book. But dude, in infinite mode, I mean, it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it was vital. Yeah. yeah, I just don't think it's like first playthrough. I just wanted to have more fun with just kind of all the items and all stuff like that. Like to me, like that kind of stuff, the magazine is definitely like new game plus really focusing on certain things and i really like that that kind of stuff's in the game i think it's great but like you just wanted you know some wine sword i'm good to go right there um i just want to circle back real yeah, quick no, to no, the time it. than the yeah, time yeah, thing no, let's do it. Really, let's get into that more. Yeah. i really like that it makes you make choices i love that kind of shit in games where Unless you really know what you're doing or if you look at something like a guide, maybe, or if you're New Game Plus, you're going to you're going to lose people. Like I lost so many people in my run, my first run through like I just people I never met just says like so and so Joe died or something mm-hmm. like that. I just loved all that kind of shit. I love having to make choices in games like that where I don't know necessarily know what the right choice to make is. And there is a consequence no matter what I do. And I just really appreciate stuff like that. Like it's like, um. Majora's Mask. I think that's one really cool thing about Majora's Mask. Obviously, Majora's Mask, you can rewind time and do all that kind of stuff. But in this, it's very permanent. You know, if you miss something at a certain time of the day, that's it. That's it for your playthrough. And I really appreciate it. And I think that's a that's kind of a mechanic. I I know a lot of people don't really like in games because they don't like missing stuff. But I think it's really cool. And I really I really like when developers do stuff like that. But what did you think about that kind of stuff? That seems like something you might get annoyed by just being yeah, able to miss a bunch of stuff. It is an it's annoying if the game isn't manageably long. So when I encounter a game like Persona, mm-hmm. and I've only played Persona Four, and I, I don't know if I told you I, I bought Persona Three a few days ago because oh okay. it was like forty one bucks on PSN, and I'm like it's probably not going to get any cheaper than this for a Persona right. Three Reload. So I think I'll probably play that in, you know over the winter or something like that. But the thing that was frustrating to me about Persona 4 and that I thought was paralyzing in some sense was it's so fucking long. So (laughs) you don't it's the same thing I felt about Trails of Cold Steel, where it's cool that there are choices, Mm -hmm. but it's not Mass Effect where the game can be beaten in 20 or 25 hours. It's like a huge game. Right. And if you miss things in it, it's really asking a lot of you to go back and do it again or see it's like it yeah is. you got to play it twice it's like but it's fucking 80 hours long why would i want to do that but the beauty of this game is that it's really short it's actually comically short if you and this is what i love about the structure of the game is like you could just bounce out of whatever happens in the story at any time mm-hmm. it fails and then it's just the helicopter still comes after 72 hours and so you can actually just dick around mm-hmm. and the this was in the original one and i think a really vital part of it was just the idea of new game plusing over and over and over again. And you can even, as I understand it, you can get halfway through the game your first time and then start a new save with that save. So like, Oh, if you're like hmm. level 15, you can just imbue that save into a new save, even if you didn't beat it. And you could do that over and over again. And I've done this. Like I've bounced my save around from the core game to overtime mode to 72 hour mode to, you know, and then the infinity mode and then restart. And like, you could just constantly draw it forward. It, it It brings all your PP your leveling your weapon or not your weapons i guess because you would start again um but all kind of the intangibles and so i just feel like in a game like this it's not only excusable but it actually works in the other direction as a persona where it gives you a reason to play it again and you want that reason to play it again because unlike the 60 or 80 hour role-playing game i think if you were like yeah okay so i beat this game literally in eight hours or whatever whatever it takes it's like yeah so that's it but it's like no that's not it Mm because there are things you miss there are other modes there is secret there are secret endings i think there are like seven endings in the game um yeah most of them are not good what's funny is is that you only get the full picture if you get the real ending and everything else will give you little pieces of it without understanding the full picture of what's going on that leads i guess into dead rising too um so yeah i don't mind it majora's mask is i love that game and majora's mask felt manageable because like you said there it doesn't say like you have 72 hours and that's it or you have 72 hours and you can only restart time three times. It's like, no, you can really just kind of do it over and over and over and over and over again if you want. Eventually, Mm -hmm. you have to commit, you know, to like the story and get through 
as the in that game the moon gets closer and closer and all of the rest. But it was a similar thing with with Majora's Mask, where that would have, especially in high school, I would have been bothered like crazy about that. I, I remember being like, "Damn, I'm not going to get through this dungeon in time. Got to bail out." you know, and like restart time. And, but, but it's getting you right back into the action. And I think dead rising does a really, really nice job of that. As opposed to when I played persona Four golden and I was talking to Micah about it, who's a big fan of the game. And I'm like, so what did you think about the single mom? What did you think about? And she's like, I didn't even encounter that person. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. what? Like, like, you know, (laughs) like, I, like, I, I, I think I encountered her like 20 times. Like, so this is how much is in the game. And then you're asking me to play it again to see all that. That's unacceptable to me. And so it's not sure. unacceptable. It's just fucking lame, you know? Yeah, like, I get that. You know, I think that's a really good point. The length of it, like you're saying, you know, Dead Rising, eight hours, maybe 10, maybe. Yeah, but, I um, wonder what Dead. I wonder what people say on. Go ahead. I'm, I'm going to look it up how much people say it, how long it takes people to beat this. game. Yeah, but it's just like it's very replayable. And Capcom was very good about that stuff. Kind of even back during Resident Evil days, you know, the weapon unlocks and all that stuff. So. It, if you miss something, you know, it's not like it's it's no big deal. Whatever. I'll get on the next pass through. But like on Persona game. Yeah, it is a commitment. Like. I'm the kind of person that's OK with missing stuff, I guess, in my run through, you know. If I don't see it, it's OK. It's just kind of that was my experience with the game, and I'm totally cool with that. But I think for people like you and I totally understand it makes total sense. Like you want to see everything the game has to offer. It's a fucking nightmare. Because you probably feel like like you probably playing Persona, dude. You probably feel like you need like a, a guide or something with you. I the did. Whole I played, time, with, probably. Guide. I played yeah. it with like and it's it, I, I, I've i suggested so many people go to this guide on PSN profiles where it's just like a really wonderful, linear, totally spoiler free guide where it's just like, oh, July 19th, go to work. You know, July 20th, That's make sure to go here and yeah. talk to this person. It doesn't tell you anything else, but it's like this is like the, the surest way to see everything. And I still as listeners of Sacred Symbols know fucked it up anyway. And never Ugh. beat Persona 4 because I got to the very end of the game and realized I fucked up the social links and didn't get that. And I was so disenchanted. Oh, I'm not, no. even, I'm not even bothering. Oh, you know? man. <laughs> that sucks, dude. Wow. Um, so, but I always think I'll probably go back and play it again on console now that Golden's on sure. console. Yeah. Um, and the, I'm sure Persona 4 is going to get remade like 3 did. So maybe yeah, I'll just wait will. for that. Because Persona 4, I love it. It's probably mm-hmm. the game I love the most that I never beat. But yeah. And I also didn't see the twist in it coming. Like, I didn't know, you know, like the mystery of like who the murderer yeah. is. And I was like, oh, my. God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. I didn't had no idea. So it's a really special game. But yeah, I just by the way, uh, how long the beat says 10 and a half hours for main story and 12 hours for main and sides. The thing power picks as usual. I love power picks, but way under shooting how long it takes to platinum the game. It's like 20 to 25 hours. I'm like in no universe. Yeah, does it take. Tw- I don't know where the fuck they get these numbers from. <laughs> like, seriously, I have no idea where that like. It makes me feel inadequate because the guides are always so good, but the guidance on how long it takes is always wrong. And I'm like, I this is taking me twice as long as this. I, who's doing yeah. this 20 hours? How? I don't know. Some some maniac, I guess. I don't know. Some maybe an expert with the game already who know, already knows it inside and out. Yeah. Like, going into it. Well, that's what's fun is that it, it it is funny how like how easy it is to just get through the game once you just, again, know what you're doing. But how exciting and challenging and scary it is when you don't know anything it's yeah it is a special game like that and there are there are it's not that's super uncommon i guess but yeah the day so the day night stuff and the 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 constant moving of the clock i think is cool and i don't mind yeah like like to that point i don't mind missing stuff i also don't mind missing stuff in games that are longer where it's a binary so and this is what made fallout new vegas i think so challenging because unlike fallout 3 it wasn't clear what decisions you were making and there was a frustration in that, but kind of an unnecessary, like an unexpected kind of pleasure in that too. Me, like, oh, I actually made the wrong choice. I thought I was being a good guy. I'm being a bad guy. Fallout New Vegas did that really well. But I think about the Mass Effect trilogy, where it's like, yeah, these are binaries. You either play as a Paragon or a Renegade. And yeah. the, and the worst way to play it is to do both. Like that's the stupidest thing to do. <clears throat> where people are like, oh, sometimes I'll make this decision. Sometimes I'll make that decision. I'm like, that's that's like completely retarded. That's not the way you're supposed to play Mass Effect. But if that's what you, the way you want to play it, that's fine. But that game begs you to play it twice because it gives you two truly different experiences. Right. Um. So again, I think it can work. And again, not a very long game. I mean, every Mass Effect, yeah. game, with the exception of the first one, can be beaten in twenty to thirty hours. I think. Yeah. So. I'm not into karma systems as much like that. Where it's just very good black and white, I guess, decisions. I think it's cool that it's there, but I like, like how you're saying, I like to make different choices just depending on the circumstance. Like, I don't, I'm not going to like, 
in some games I would, you know, like infamous infamous two or whatever. It's like, I'm going to be good Colt or whatever. Cause mm. I want the blue lightning and all these powers, but I usually don't like doing good boy path, bad boy path kind of thing like that. I like having a little wiggle room in there in between, but I think that's something that got better on later in games. You know, you remember fable one, it's like the good, the good path. You get the little halo over your head. Or if you're the bad, you grow the horn, stuff like that. I think that's cool, but I like how games kind of evolved. Give me a little more middle room gr- the gray path i guess you could say yeah infamous did that a little bit with the i i liked the representation of like the choices you're making mass affected it too but where like cole gets like darker looking and more brooding the more right decisions he makes the thing i don't like about binary um like systems of um good and bad and all these things is if there are sequels the game kind of makes a choice for you this this happened in Infamous. Right. yeah where the that's good, true or i think the good choice in infamous one is like what infamous two is based on so everything that happens at the end of infamous if you play as a as a bad guy it doesn't even count and that that to me is a little weirder yeah yeah but, i get that but i also understand that you're not going to make a sequel and then make it two different sequels basically it's which would be pretty fucking crazy um, and, and actually insane. a pretty would actually be a pretty interesting idea in and of itself like we mm-hmm. have this game there are two huge different endings and then we make a sequel that reads that save Mass Effect style, but you really do get two different experiences based on like what you did. I'm That'd like, be insane. That would be very difficult and expensive and probably not worth it. But um, no. Yeah, but that would be an interesting thing nonetheless. What did you think of the story in in Dead Rising? I have to be honest, like I could give a shit about the story in this game. I don't think Frank's a really interesting character. I don't really. I think the photography stuff's a little forced in the game. It's cool, especially mm-hmm. the way the game introduces the photography. You're on the helicopter. You're learning about earning PP and taking pictures and stuff, but it's actually like it makes it seem like it's going to be a really important part of the game. And in reality, it's an irrelevant part of the game unless yeah. you do that one photography side quest, which is there's only one and which you can easily miss with the dude in the fucking co- coffee shop upstairs. So I just felt like I I didn't care about any of the story. I liked the, I liked being there, but the whole thing of like the I wrote down some of the stuff here. What is it? Um, yeah, it's in Willamette, Colorado. And San Cabe- Santa Cabeza is this place in Central America where they're doing these experiments on cattle mm-hmm. and something to do with these wasps that you find in these jars around. And the mall is quarantined because of this. But they're, I think Dead Rising 2 kind of goes off of this about how there are other points of infection and all the rest. So I, I just didn't care. I got to be honest. Yeah, I, care. I think the story is like the least important aspect of the game. And I think the game kind of acknowledges that you know it's like it's not a big fucking deal i think i thought the idea the premise of like trying to grow more meat or whatever they were trying to do that down there or something like that i thought that was interesting and just fucking everything up down there and i guess like what was the the guy's name was it like carlito or something like that Yeah, carlito like, who's his, the brother of the of that other female character the girl name. yeah i forgot her name yeah. but um <laughs> i think that's like oh isabella that's all, isabella isabella that's like you don't need a lot of story for this kind of game like that. And it kind of reminded me of an umbrella just slightly. So I like that, but it's fine. It's whatever. It's pretty throwaway, but it's there if you want it, I guess. But I don't really care about it as, like you. Yeah, the photo- the photography stuff itself. I was like, I don't. Yeah, the photography stuff is just I don't know. It, it's as a mechanic. I think it's. Pretty throwaway, honestly, I think it's it's just something they tried, I think, you know, yeah, this guy's a photography you take photos in the game like that it's like a way of getting xp i guess that's interesting but i kind of like didn't really care about doing it at all except for those times in boss fights they it would pop up the little pp thing and i was like i don't know what this is but i'm gonna make sure to get it during those fights but yeah i think it's kind of throwaway honestly it, it made me wonder it's like it's cool but i don't know i it seemed like they were really focused on like he's a photojournalist yeah and i'm like but sure. why like, but yeah, why? Like, why, why can't you just be a regular journalist and mm-hmm. not have this this obsession with the camera that doesn't really play into the game? I do like the aesthetic, especially in the key art of like him holding the camera and there's like zombies behind him. It's the aesthetic is cooler than what they actually do with it. It's right. not like a I'm not saying they're similar games, but it's not like a game like Outlast where it's like everything's through the camera. You have to use it to see and survive and all of that. Like that. It's not like he's presumably in the background he's taking pictures to prove the case of what's going on here and if you get the good ending he leaves and these photos end up being really important i will say and i pointed it out to, out to micah and she's like you're totally right is i'm like there's this insistence that the character model holds the camera when mm-hmm. you're when his back's facing you and it looks like he's holding his guts 
or like yeah, he's, he, like he's injured really annoying you know like you have to get used to it and realize oh no you're not hurt it's just his weird clumsy way of holding the camera and since you can never really turn it around to see him you can never really it doesn't really ever look right it looks, yeah he's kind he of looks like a gorilla up. running around that's what i always pictured him as and he himself is just, i mean frank is just like a weird character like I, he looks weird it's 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 cool it's just i'm not trying to hate on it i just yeah none of that is important in fact i think mm-hmm. that i think it, like you said with the story about like american consumption and meat and all this kind of stuff and and it taking place in a mall and when it's taking place because this is before the recession the you know the the early to mid aughts are boom time in the united states and around the world and i think that the game is more is less about frank as a conduit to whatever and more about consumerism like everything Mm -hmm. and i don't want to say it like has dead rising has a serious take it doesn't but it is it is supposed to be about i think about like consumption and how ridiculous it is and it takes place in the middle of america in a mall in a shopping mall a beautiful up upscale mall the kind of which are the only malls that are really surviving these days actually mm-hmm. you know the the uh the nicer boutique malls and the outdoor malls and all that kind of stuff so yeah the, the story itself just didn't play for me at all i just didn't give a shit at, at, yeah. at all and um th- did you play overtime mode no i just did one run one playthrough just so you didn't do the mode where true i got the true ending or whatever but i've done those modes in the past like back in the day but this time no wait so to get the true ending though you uh, i want to make sure we're on the oh no wait so yeah i got like the fourth day it it probably was yes so that i didn't do the mode after you unlock that yeah so there's 72 hour mode which is the game overtime mode which is that fourth day and yes i did that infinity mode which is like the the i didn't do infinity mode and in infinity mode, infinity mode is is awesome. Actually, it's just it's really tough. It took me a few like mo- go through like attempts, I should say, to really understand what I was supposed to be doing for people that didn't play it. It it, it dares you to live as long as you can. And you could conceivably maybe go forever if you mm-hmm. really, really knew what you were doing. But the game, you know, you learn playing 72 hour mode, you can kind of regenerate weapons, regenerate health items and all that by leaving and coming back later and all the rest. And in this mode, everything you use and touch and grab is gone. So Mm -hmm. if you grab a weapon in a certain place, it will not reappear. If you grab, you know, the juice behind the counter at this restaurant, it will not be there anymore. And the thing that keeps you going is that psychopaths and survivors appear throughout the mall randomly, and you have to just kill them and grab what's on them. And often it's like food, often rare or, or raw food and you have to go cook it and all that kind of stuff. So it asks you to survive under these conditions for seven days. And it seems easy at first, but then you realize like, well, actually it's really difficult. But like I said, it's way easier than it was in the original one. Cause in the original one, you couldn't fast forward time. So it had to happen not in real time, but in the in game time mm-hmm. where a minute is a few seconds or whatever. And you couldn't save the, the cool thing that this mode does in this game is you can make like a throwaway auto save that it's like, do you want to suspend infinity mode? And then it's like, OK, when you continue the, you know, and then you continue that that save is erased. You can spoof your saves. And I did mm-hmm. um, every day or day and a half in the game. I would just, you know, suspend it and then send it to the cloud and then restart the game from that save and it would destroy oh, the save. Okay. But if I fucked up, then I would just go to the cloud and download the old save and i think i did that a couple of times but man i was i was not even interested none of my friends cared about achievements when xbox 360 came out and i didn't really understand them or know about them when the xbox 360 came out so it never came up but i saw a video some years ago of a guy doing the dead rising 70 or um seven day survival achievement on xbox 360 and it really was like fucking crazy how hard it was damn because you couldn't there's no auto saving right there's no suspend mode there's no fast forwarding time and you have to like survive. So it's, I think it comes out to 14 hours, which is two hours a day, I guess. Um, and you have to, so you can pause the game, but you can't shut it off or anything like that. And I saw a video of someone doing this. I was like, wow, this is fucking hardcore, dude. And so I'm glad mm-hmm. that they tamped that down a little bit because I would have never in a million years done that. But there, yeah. but, but there is something to the idea of like, what if you just kept it the same? But I think to the spirit of the remaster, I think they were like, we're going to clean some of this stuff up. It doesn't, why does it need to be this fucking stupid? It's already hard. <laughs> you know yeah like why can't yeah, yeah. we let you like suspend it <laughs> you know and come yeah, back to totally. it um so yeah i liked that mode a lot and and to and if you get to five days you unlock the laser sword if you get to seven you unlock the infinite um durability for your weapons 
And then did you kill? I, I doubt you did the 52 or 53,000 zombies. No, if you do, no, no, no. If you do that, you get the Mega Buster. Right. And, which is the strongest projectile weapon in the game. And I did that by just going. I read about this online. I just put on like podcasts and I went into the tunnels underneath the, the mall. Mm -hmm. and like the, And there's one specific corner where a shit ton of zombies always are. If you just kind of come back and forth and it's just like doing this for <laughs> hours to kill them but but people were like you really want the mega buster before you try anything else because it is so hard it is so much easier with these weapons and it really was I, yeah kudos to people that do survival mode like straight up because i where you have to like yeah, really go brutal. find things and survive and you have to combat the the psychopaths to live and all of that so you're really putting yourself in serious danger yeah not for me but a really cool package <laughs> of stuff you know mm -hmm. too. And, yeah yeah uh, yeah so let me see here. Let me go through my rest of my notes here. God, I think we almost, oh, any memorable like rescues of survivors? There are a few. I liked the one where um, you go to the bookstore and there's the two Japanese people and you have to find a Jap in the bookstore. There's like a Japanese translation manual and you have to use it mm -hmm. to speak to them. I thought that was pretty cool. Oh, that is I don't cool. know if you did that. I didn't yeah. run into them. like they won't. I didn't run into them. They're like Japanese tourists in a bookstore and they they won't come with you or you can't understand each other. But if you search the bookstore, you'll realize one of the books is like a Japanese translation manual. And if you equip it, oh. then talk to them. Then they'll That's come cool. with you. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, um, I didn't run into that during this. Um, I'm just trying to think, like. One of the survivors early on, his name was Jeff, I remember. And I just forgot to take Jeff back to the hide out for me and jeff was just with me for like an hour and i kind of grew some weird fond attachment to him i don't know it's not like a story thing but it was like my own personal experience with him and jeff was just rolling with me deep with like a katana just cutting zombies up and i loved it but the ai is improved but it's still kind of bad a lot of times and jeff just got stuck somewhere and i fucking lost him and it just said jeff has died and i was like no jeff dude but um yeah other than that I didn't have I could, like the Japanese one you're saying is really cool. I didn't run into them, but um, the movie theater one I liked also where they're all tied up and yeah, I all the girls from a closet. Then like a bunch of the cultists busted in real quick and a bunch of my people got killed by accident from them. It was awesome. I just love that kind of stuff. Yeah, there was um, I wrote down a few others. The uh, well, we talked about her earlier, but the prisoners that steal the truck outside, like the the, the woman whose mm -hmm. husband is killed. I like how they're just kind of fucking with her the entire time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can go save her. I think you can carry her or hold her hand and bring her quicker. I like the um, you find the fat guy in Jill's sandwiches. Nice Resident mm -hmm. Evil reference, of course. Um, And he if you go in there, you go in there at a certain time and there's food in the. I don't know if you noticed this. Like, so you go into Jill sandwiches and there's food there. And then if you go at a certain time, that guy's in there and the food is gone because he ate it all. <laughs> did you did you did you mean? No, this I. And I don't you, remember call if I did. And then you bring him back. And it's one of the few characters that threatens to mutiny. Did you encounter? Any oh, of this? I did. Yeah, I had to go back there and like calm him down. Yeah, you have to like whatever. give him food because he because then yeah. so he eats all the food and Jill sandwiches. So you can't go there anymore. And then to get food, which is fine, because there's food a billion other places. But then you'll find that there are there's some food in your hideout in the security office. And then that everything's gone in there, too, because he ate it all, basically. Mm -hmm. And then he threatens to mutiny and like bring people with him if you don't bring him more food. So that was like I thought that was a kind of a cool little yeah. arc there. Yeah. And, one of the women wanted like a handgun or something, too. Right. Yeah. There's another I one. I forgot to give it to her. But yeah, I like stuff like that. That's cool. And um, I like just encountering there. There's just a lot of cool quirks like there. There are the two women where one of them won't leave without the other one like you have to go and kind of rescue one of the women and bring her back and prove that she's alive for the other woman to kind of like get her bearings and come with you mm -hmm. i like how some of them are disabled or old or just scared and so you have to hold their hands or carry them and that really affects your ability so like if you're with a few people maybe you give your weapons to other people and hope that they kind of spray and give you a, a way forward as this person's on your back or you're holding the woman's hand or whatever i think there's really cool stuff with that i think I think the AI is actually improved, as I remember, too, from the original, it is. which is nice. So it's not quite as frustrating using them and getting them through. I do wonder how long you can just keep them with you. As I said earlier in the conversation, you can only eight survivors will spawn at a time mm -hmm. and you can have up to eight with you. I wonder if you could just theoretically arm them and keep them with you forever um, because uh, probably. I, well, actually, I guess not because you do have to return to the security room 
occasionally oh, stories. Yeah, but that's true. Could you just tell them to wait somewhere and then go to the security room and then come back? I think you could probably do it because you could also give them food to heal them. So mm-hmm. they could theoretically stay alive forever. I would be interested to see that. There's a few. This yeah. is the funny thing about the game, Brad, to me is like there are a few things where this game begs like funny ways to play through it. And I, I do love the idea of the pacifist run. Like how can you get through the game killing? Is, what's the minimum amount of people you can kill to do the game yeah. properly? Can you go through it without killing? Like, can you can you write a Frank like a meta Frank character that doesn't want to hurt any of the zombies because he doesn't <laughs> understand that they're zombified and he thinks they're going to come back or whatever? Very yeah. similar to the, the conundrums you find in like Resident Evil and The Last of Us and all that kind of stuff when people like don't want to. Or that famous Walking Dead where the guy keeps his daughter chained up under like right. he zombified. Doesn't want to kill him. Yeah. So there's like cool different ways to like add a meta level to the story that would be so much more <laughs> interesting than everything else. The one thing I did find frustrating from a gameplay perspective was just the the human enemies because they can stun lock you so Dude, easily. It's so SWAT annoying. SWAT guys are they're so annoying, man. I hate those guys. They're so bad. Like I don't even bother trying to shoot them later on with their own like unless you got the rocket launcher right. I guess but like I found it just way easier to melee them to death but yeah God, you can run yeah, up to they, them and grab them and just kind of throw them mm-hmm. there's a trophy for doing for for killing 30 of them with melee combat which I did I just did last night by respawning them over and over again and um it's really really annoying you have to have like a shit ton of health it's not something that's possible to do in the course of the actual game I don't think um What's up? Yeah, what else? That's terrible. And the final boss or whatever on top of the tank. Also terrible. I hate that fight. Yeah, that trying fight. to do like they're trying to do uh, Metal Gear Solid Definitely. with like snake and liquid on there. But it's just like not nearly as cool, man. There is a Metal Gear quality to this game. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying from a qual- like from a literal quality of the game perspective. I'm saying there's just a, they, a Metal Gear quality to it. Like it's it's weird. It's quirky. It's a little bit funny. And it's got like these weird enemies that are characters yeah. around like enemy lieutenants, very Metal Gear vibe. I don't know. I definitely I'm glad you brought that up because I, I didn't put that in my notes and I did. I did think that when I was playing. It's like, yeah, there is some sort of Kojima attempt here. Like, I think mm-hmm. it, it's definitely people were definitely playing Metal Gear Solid 2 and maybe three. Three is a little close to when this game came out, but I don't know how much you've been yeah. inspired by it. Is there anything else that you wanted to say? I mean, I, I feel like we've already said so much. I don't know. Yeah, I feel like, yeah, we've talked a lot about the game. I don't know. I'm just happy Dead Rising is back, I guess, in general. I think it's good. It's been especially four. Everyone tell me four is terrible, which is really a bummer because like Frank's back in and everything like that. So, I mean, hopefully this will be if this does well, maybe Capcom revisiting the series. I don't think they need to remake every game or something. I'd actually like to see just a new Dead Rising or a reboot completely, but I am happy to see it back. You know, I think it's a good franchise. I think there's potential there, so I'm happy. Hopefully, it's kind of like what I was hoping uh, would happen with Onimusha, but I don't know about that, sadly. But I would love I bought that damn remaster. I I bought it. I bought it. You motherfuckers out there. You didn't buy it. Yeah, I know. I, I was, bought it, too. I couldn't believe it really when it came out. I was like, and when they announced it, I was like, really? Like, that's all. Because I love Animusha 1 and 2 and 4. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I, I, I'm I really into Capcom right now. I, I mean, I've always loved Capcom, but I just think they're doing a really nice job. And I think they're doing a really nice job of managing their catalog of creating new product and also supporting the old product and getting, I think, most importantly, the old product into a more permanent state where you can expect that this is the way the game will live. This is what I've been talking about on sacred symbols with what I hope Sony will do is show some restraint. I don't mind that they go back and remaster horizon zero dawn. It looks beautiful. I mean, it's incredible how, what they've done to it. I think that people think that that game is more beautiful than it is. It's old and or mm-hmm. older. And I don't mind these companies spending a little time and money getting things into like, this is the permanent state as I would call it for the game. Like this is the way we expect you'll play it from now on, even in 20 years. And as long as these companies can just do that and move on, especially because a lot of these games are stranded on old hardware or whatever the case might be. But I just want to make sure that they're not going to do another one of these in 10 years and then another one in 10 years. That's the thing right. that I, I and, and again, it's almost like that might be the intent now, but you never know who's going to run these companies in 10 or 20 years when they're like time to make Horizon remastered again, you know, mm-hmm. and so I don't mind. I, what I'm saying is, is I like the idea of going back and cleaning this shit up. But just mm-hmm. make sure you do it once and then right. move on with your life. And this is why I'm eager to get like 
a lot of stuff from PS3 and PS2, you know, like God of War and Infamous and Resistance and all that stuff up on, on PS4 specifically, just so because I feel like that's the, the PS4 games will always be playable moving forward. Like, I totally, truly believe that. I think you're crazy if you don't believe that. Um, and because that's like the beginning of kind of your unified catalog. And I think ideally they'd want to go even further back and allow your PS3 games to be accessible. And I don't think that that's really going to happen. But I think this is actually an, an unintuitively a wise use of your time because it revives something. It's it's cheap. It's built on the bones of something. You don't have to design it. You know, people have right. probably I'm not saying that the same people are working on this game all the way through. I doubt that. But there probably are some people and even people that were fans of the game and they were like, yeah, what if we could just clean this up? What mm -hmm. if you could just move while you shoot? Um, yep. What if you could save during infinity mode? <laughs> like little things like that. <laughs> and what if we could just make it look like a PS4 game? Maybe. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's by any stretch of the imagination, anything that's crazy. So no. So I, yeah, I dig it. it. It actually reminds me a lot of we were praising um, the legacy of Kane remasters that are coming out or those remakes where it's like, yeah, these kind of look like PS2 games, like mm -hmm. high res, late gen PS2 games. And that looks that's great. As long as we yeah. have this, uh, and then just leave it. Yeah, I agree. So, yeah, I, I hope that that's. It, yeah. But shout out to Capcom, dude, because I think that. You know, they're doing the fighting game collections, right? But they're also supporting the new Street Fighter They're They're putting out games like Kanitsugami, which I think is really, really good and underrated. It seems like no one really played it, um, which is sad because I think it's really, really great. Um, and then they're doing things like Dragon's Dogma, right? They got the Dead Rising remaster coming out. They're doing all the Resident Evil stuff, both with the old games. You know, it seems like Zero and Code Veronica are going to be next, plus a Resident Evil 9 that's inevitable. It's like they they really are achieving the best of both worlds. They're, yeah. They're, the balance is actually extraordinary. Uh, and yeah. I think, so. you know, I'd love to see that kind of balance with Sony. We're getting Until Dawn imminently. That's going to be cool. We're getting Horizon, but it's like, yeah, these should be part of the cake. We need a little more of the other stuff or we'd like a little yeah. bit of the other stuff. I just... I think just the thing about Sony is they're just not giving people the remaster that everyone actually wants. It's like until dawn, I guess it's like, does this really need a remake? I'm going to buy it. It doesn't. No. I know. I know a lot of people are going to buy it. It's totally cool, but it's just like, all right, I guess it's like everyone just wants Bloodborne, and you know this, of course, but it's just like, why are you guys doing these specific ones? I don't understand why you're doing these ones. I think if they gave people what they wanted in some other ones first, then they'd be much more okay with it. Like Horizon is fine. It doesn't really bother me that much, but I, I do understand the frustration of that. But sorry to back on Capcom. I want to just echo what you've been saying about how much they've been killing it on all fronts, smaller scale, big scale. Like they just had this coming out. They got Monster Hunter Wilds coming out. That's going to be fucking humongous, that game. So Capcom is just in an awesome state right now. It's a great time to be a Capcom fan. Some of the collections they're doing, like their Marvel vs. Capcom, all that stuff's been great. I hope they bring some more of their um, platformers back. Did you ever play um, the new Ghosts and Goblins? It's like no. they brought back that back. I never played it either, but it's like they brought that back. And so I've been very happy as a Capcom fan recently. And like, how can you not be? The question is, when are they going to bring back Lost Planet? And if they need to at all. <laughs> Lost Planet. Yeah. I thought you were going to say, when are they going to bring back Mega Man? Um, oh, I think Mega Man will come back. Just I think so. I think it's obvious that. Yeah, the that did you fill out that stuff that they did earlier this year that that quit that um, questionnaire? Yeah. I did, too. Yeah. And they had said that Mega Man was like the second most requested. Game. Yeah, yeah. And I think that was probably shocking to them. But I mean, when you look at the things they own, I think that there's like a few things that they can like. I would really like to see um, a return. Like you said, the Animusha and Mega Man are, are, are the big ones to me. But you have things like Breath of Fire that are kind of mm -hmm, not the main thing. Mm -hmm. I think even stuff like Bionic Commando would be kind of interesting. Although they did try yeah. to do that during the PS3 era and it didn't really take off too much. So, uh, but I think the, the management of their, their products, both looking backwards and forwards, has been really strong. And I also think that they were really amongst the first to do these really nice collections that I think are the standard. Frankly, Konami is doing collections at that standard as well, which is strange. Um, yeah. But like the Mega Man <laughs> Legacy Collection, when that came out in 2016 or whatever it was, it was incredible. I was like, this is incredible. Yeah. You know, now it should have had a platinum trophy. They totally dropped the ball on that. Um, but yeah, just having these wack. games and the museum content and the artwork and the music. And so I think they've just been we are so far away from the era of Crapcom at this point that it's kind of astounding. They really did turn it around. They were yeah. the, they were people have to remember when Inafune went off. 
on Japanese game development and basically went into the wilderness for a while. He was at Capcom and talking about Capcom. Mm-hmm. You know, it, 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 it was true for multiple and many of the studios and publishers there, but he was talking about Capcom and how bad it was and how yeah. fucking crazy that like how I got to go back in. We should revisit that one day about like all the shit he said, because it's been almost 15 years, I would say, since maybe 14, 13 and a half years where he was basically like Japanese games suck. <laughs> and I don't know what everyone's doing. And I think that that what I don't think he's ever going to be credited for waking the people the fuck up because I think he did. Right. Right. Now, Japanese, what he was basically saying was like, look at what the Western developers are doing. Why can't we borrow from them like they've borrowed from us? That was basically the through line to increase. Our games are looked at as being bad right now. And Capcom is like just the most vibrant thing, you know, yeah, and frankly, it. so is Bandai Namco. So is Koei Tecmo. So is Square Enix, although their their expectations are never met, you know. Um, mm-hmm. So, but the quality is there, I'd say, from oh, game yeah. wise, very so, high. I was good, talking. Yeah. I, I did a podcast appearance just recently where we were talking about Final Fantasy 16 and how like this game's fucking insanely good. Are you kidding? Mm-hmm. And then and then they come out and say like, oh, we only sold three million unit copies <laughs> in a week on one console. It didn't meet our expectations. It's like okay, dude. I, yeah, I know Square's incredibly frustrating in that sense. The worst. Co- they're they're the worst. Like they're the company I want to get shaken up the most. It's like you guys are fucking crazy. You don't know what you're yeah. doing. You have the most powerful back catalog, frankly, of um, amongst a lot of these companies. You don't wield it properly, and then you have these crazy expectations. Why do you guys keep undercutting yourselves? And then and then you release statements that make yourselves look bad. It doesn't. I was arguing on the show. I was like, it's almost unfiduciary where you'd think you would think that they would be like, we have an obligation to make reasonable expectations for our games because every time we release, we release a game and then it doesn't meet our expectations, then that's all anyone talks about. And it hurts us more and more. Why mm-hmm. don't we, who is forecasting over there? Is it like, a, know, is it like a fucking blind person that doesn't know how to, like doesn't read and doesn't play games. and doesn't know anything. Yeah. So what do they think they're going to get? Witcher three numbers or something. It's like, come on guys. Three million on, on a, on a dude, three million in a week on a, an install base at that time of 40 million. What did you think? What do you think you're Madden? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. They're crazy. So I think Capcom is, and then you see Capcom saying like, Oh, we sold 2 million copies of dragon's dogma. Fuck. Yeah. Yeah. They're stoked on they're multiple like consoles, fired. you know, like, sold 3 million. They're right. Like, fuck. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. I, I know <laughs> it's just night and day. And it's so, it is really frustrating because it's just totally detached from reality. I know. And <sighs> they're, they're, they're their own worst enemy. When they realize that Final Fantasy isn't The Witcher, like you said, and Dragon Quest isn't a very relevant thing, and a Kingdom Hearts could be huge and has been huge, but it's like just be who you are. And yeah, you want mm-hmm. bigger audiences, but God, your games are killing right now. Don't you understand that you're sending mixed messages because your games are kind of better than they've ever been, at least in modernity? Yeah, like Rebirth's like what? One of the highest rated games of the year right now? It's like you guys are the quality is so high right now. Just give yourself a break, for God's sakes. I know. It's really, really, it's ridiculous. So, nonetheless. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that's Dead Rising. I, I, What was it, 50 bucks or 40? Yeah, 50. 50 bucks. I think that's, I think that's a perfectly reasonable price. I, cause I, I yeah. think, and I understand Dustin was saying, I think it was Dustin that was saying, like, was it him or was it someone else? That is, they were kind of put off by the price. And it's like, sure. and I'm like, yeah, I get it. Um, but, I'm not sure there's anything to really be put off by. It's it's a, a, a robust the, game. Fifty dollars, I think, is a perfectly fine price for this game. I think it is. What you, I could see that maybe for someone who hasn't played Dead Rising or hasn't a lot of experience, and then just seen fifty bucks and being like, ah, it's kind of expensive. Well, because I mean, fifty is the new forty anyway, so it's a little off putting for people, right? But once you get into the game, you're like, oh yeah, this is totally worth fifty bucks easily. I wonder. Is it like a game that you have to run out and play? No. Probably not. You know, I, I would say it's. It is it is if you're looking for something that's just like fun and kinetic mm-hmm. and doesn't really demand any like it doesn't it's not like a fucking Metal Gear game where you're like studying it or something. Yeah, I think I, I think I could really scratch an itch for some people right now. It definitely yeah. is a game, you know, like yeah, it's, a it's game. just a good time. Yeah, it's just a good time. Like it's a kind of game you could be playing with your buddy, just handing off the controller with each other. Like, I'll play 30 minutes. You play 30 minutes. Well, that's just that, watch each other dick around and stuff. 
that's what I was. I said that on um, Sacred when we were just talking about playing it briefly. And that, that's it's so funny you bring that up because I was like, that was we did. My friends and I in college did kind of play it a little bit like a Grand Theft Auto game, mm-hmm. um, especially because, as I recall, there was no auto saving and stuff. So you could just kind of boot up a save and then just dick around. And there really was no consequence to the person's game. Like if you did that the, on GTA, it was kind of kind of got annoying after a while because you kept losing money and like. <laughs> you know, like there was some sort of stupid consequence and you would kind of want your friends not to get too carried away with that so it did have that vibe it's definitely got it's got a little bit of rockstar in it it's got a little bit of metal gear in it like i said it's got a little bit of mega man in it and yeah i think it's yeah 50 dollars well spent dead rising the luxury master hope to see more out of these out of capcom like you said so many mm-hmm. games that they can revisit in this style but yeah let's show a little restraint if we do it yeah um all right we'll leave it there brad i appreciate you uh, what are you going to be doing for the rest of your day? Mm, the rest of my day? I don't know about that. I'm probably going to play maybe more Zelda today. Echoes of Wisdom. Yeah, I'm Mike is playing, playing that. right now. It's yeah, so, so why play. is the screen so zoomed in? <laughs> I, I don't know. Get over it. <laughs> Mikey gets mad at me when I criticize games she plays, so I don't even say things anymore. But I, that's all I can. That's all I can think about when I, I'm looking at it. And I'm like, I don't know. Why is this, why is it to. so close? I can't see anything. You know? Yeah, I think you just get used to it, but I understand that. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, I have a bunch of things to do. I don't know what I'm going to do, to be honest. I could mow the lawn. I could play games. Like, I think I have a call with do Kathy it? at four, so I have to do that. Okay. Yeah. Mow the lawn when it's cooler out, though. Don't don't burn up. Yeah. Yeah, it's cloudy, which is good, uh, but it's probably a little too wet to mow. I'll have to go back there and check. Sure. All right, my friend. Well, be well. Thank you for your time. Um, everyone yeah. can find Brad over on Summon Sign, of course. Mm-hmm. Our weekly conversation all about video games. Great job with the show. You're doing awesome. Thank you. And um, yeah, I'll have you back on too. What do you play? So what are you playing these coming? Are you playing? Are you going to play until dawn? No, I'm going to play Silent Hill 2. Silent Hill. Okay, me too. And Metaphor. Are Metaphor, me too. Okay. Two. Yeah, yeah. Metaphor is pretty close now, I think. Yes, it is. It's like a little over a week away. Wow. Was yeah. it nine days from now? Nine days. Okay, yeah. So. I could bang out until dawn pretty quick. And then, yeah. yes, Silent Hill, I'll probably get into after that. Yeah, we have. OK, cool. So we'll have you back on Sacred Plus to talk about one or more mm-hmm. of those games. Um, well, I appreciate you. Thank you for that, uh, for your time. And uh, good luck with Summon Sign. Thank you all Thank out you. there for your love, kindness, and support. All things Sacred Symbols, Last Day Media, etc. You know the drill. Patreon.com slash Last Day Media for early ad free access, etc. Last Day Media dot store for merch. Until next time. Goodbye. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is a product and trademark of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC and is proudly recorded in the USA. The show is conceived by, is written by, and is directed by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-hosts are Chris Raygun Maldonado and Dustin Furman. The show is produced by executive producer Dustin Furman. It's edited by associate producer Ben Smith. All of Last Stand's theme music is by my best friend, Ramon Narvaez. As you know, all of Last Stand's shows, including Sacred Symbols, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer level on Patreon, our highest tier, and we're grateful for your thoughtful and kind contributions to our independent endeavor. Thank you.